Can you hear me, Pastor? Yes, ma'am, I can. Oh, because you didn't make any noise. I couldn't hear anything. Yep, I can hear you just fine. Okay, good. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, we are going to be in Romans 9. Romans good 9. Evening. Good evening, Miss Jackie. <laughs> Um, let's see, let me do that. All right. Chapter nine. Um, I think we're going to start. Uh, we're going to start about verse 19. Let's do a quick recap of what we talked about last week. And then, um, and then we'll go from there. Hey, Twyla. Hey, everybody. How you doing, Pastor? Hi, Twyla. How y'all doing? Fine, thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. Romans chapter nine. Um, like I said, we'll begin right around verse 19. Um, let us open with a word of prayer. Eternal God, um, in all that's going on, um, we need you. We need you now more than we've ever needed you before. And so as we join together in this study of your word, we pray your presence would be real. Lord, we are excited to hear what you have to say to us. But God, let us not get distracted by anything that's outside of you right now, that we might learn, that we might grow, that we might be changed, that we might be transformed from who we are into who you want us to be. God, we pray for those who are online. We pray for those that will be joining. And we say a special prayer for those who had no desire to be here this evening. Lord, we ask that you would give them a hunger for your word and that they will want to hear from you. And so, God, one, one thing we ask one more time, speak. Please speak, Lord, because your servants are listening and we need to hear from you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, so Romans chapter nine, um, a lot going on in that first section um, that we talked about um, last week. And we've got a lot of huge uh, theological things going on. Uh, this chapter talks about election. Uh, the bottom line, it, it really asks the question, or it shows the passion of Paul when he deals with the nation of Israel. Uh, there are some that would teach you today that uh, in the church age, God is done with Israel. I, he, he doesn't care about Israel anymore. That would be a problem in my mind because Jesus is Jewish. Yeah. So it'd be a real problem. For uh, It would just seem unreal to me that God would give up on, you know, <laughs> The people that he used. And so when we hear that, we need to make sure that we don't fall into that trap of believing that uh, God has no need for the Jews. And what we see from Paul is, hey, Paul starts to say, look, if I could give up my salvation, if there was any way for me to be cursed, I would do it because I want them to be saved so bad. And the challenge that I issued to each one of us was we care about other people's salvation that much do do we are we really serious about people getting into heaven uh that much that we would be willing to quote unquote give up our salvation for them and that's something that we can say uh but the challenge for us is will we actually uh go out of our way for other people in that manner and so we want to challenge ourselves with that um, as we got into um, verse uh, 14 uh, and on, it, it, there were some questions that Paul was asking if, if God is unjust for the way that he treats people. And uh, in verse uh, 15, uh, we have God telling Moses, I will show mercy to whom I'm sh I will show mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And uh, there's, a, there's an S word that we use for God um, when we talk about his leadership, his 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 uh his right to make decisions anybody know what that word is sovereign sovereign 
sovereign. He's sovereign. That means he can do what he wants to do. And that's as we move into verses 19, uh, we're going to talk about that a little more. And so when we, there is a, this, there's this very interesting thing that we've got going on, God's sovereignty, God can do whatever he wants to do, but there is a balance there between man's free will. And somehow in his sovereignty, he has given us free will to respond as we want to. And he responds to that. Do I understand it? No, I don't. Because I figure if, he, if he's sovereign, then we just stuck doing whatever he wants us to do. But he gives us free will. And so there is a marriage there that can only be understood in the mind of God. And so our challenge I would offer to you isn't so much that we understand it, but that we acknowledge his sovereignty, but we accept our responsibility as being free will agents. We're just not here floating along in the sea of history. We have a role to play. And that's what Paul is going to get us into. And so, um, as a matter of fact, Charlotte, since you were, well, you were, you know, just like Twyla a couple of weeks ago, you were out doing whatever you were doing in North Carolina and not coming to Bible study. Uh, why don't you read for us uh, Romans chapter nine, read 19 through, actually go ahead and give me 19 through 29. Okay. You will say to me, therefore, why then does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you? A human being to talk, a human being to talk back to God. Well, will what is formed say to the one who formed it? Why did you make me like this? Or has the potter no right over the clay to make from the same lump one piece of pottery for honor and another for dishonor? And what if God, wanting to display his wrath to make his power known, endured with much patience objects of wrath prepared for destruction? And what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory on objects of mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory on us? The one he called, he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As it also says in Hosea, I will call not my people, my people, and she who is unloved, beloved. And it will be in the place where they were told. You are not my people. There they be called sons of the living God. But Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of Israelites is like the sand of the sea, only the remnants will be saved since the mm -hmm. Lord is sentence completely and decisively on the earth. And just as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of armies had not left us offspring, we would have become like Sodom. And we would have been made like the more. Right. Okay. So, so we start with a question. And, and the question is, <laughs> if, if God is sovereign and he's made us how he wants to make us, why, why does he find fault? I mean, you know, and, and I know none of you have said this because you are good, holy people. But we know other people said, well, he made me this way. Right. So since he made me this way, I can go ahead and live this way. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, why did you, I, I had a friend of mine, she used to all the time, she said, uh, God made me wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and every time she said that, I kind of ducked like this and I, <laughs> I, I looked around. And, 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 and so, so here's the question that I have for you. When you read verses 19 and, well, really verse 20, but who are you, mere man, to talk back to God? Does this mean we cannot ask God questions? No. No, no we can. Okay, I, I just want to make sure we're, we're supposed to. What we have here, the issue isn't the question. The issue is the intent behind the question. Mm -hmm. This is one of these questions that says, man, what you doing? You done messed up. And, and, and that kind of question, because Job kind of got into that a little bit, and God came back and said, okay, so tell me where you were. When I created this, can you tell me where, where do I store all the snow before yeah. it snows? And he said, because we're asking questions about things that we don't fully understand. Mm -hmm. All right. And so now the, um, some of our foreparents, they took this, oh, don't question God. We see questions of God throughout the Bible, correct? Yeah. Right. Yep. All the time there are questions. We have questions. But when we ask questions, actually looking for an answer, or when we ask questions to accuse, there's a difference in that. 
And, okay, and what we are being warned against is that, is that difference of asking a question, trying to say, God, you don't know what you're doing. Mm. I'd like to have some questions about what you're doing and what, what, God, what's going on here. Help me to understand. Or I'm accusing him of, hey, God, you're, you're handling this all wrong. And that's a problem. And so mm. go ahead, Renee. It reminds me a little bit like when we judge people we're not to judge people but we can judge their behavior yeah, and i think okay. sometimes we do that with god we want to judge him uh, instead of asking him like you said a question to better understand why something is absolutely mm. absolutely mm. and so that's when he goes into the whole potter and clay uh, a, a statement and understand because one of the things we don't understand when we say we were built wrong or uh, what you know why did you build why did you put this in me is because we don't understand God's purpose. Yeah. yeah. Because the bottom line is we were built perfectly for what He wants us to do. The mm -hmm. issue many of us have is we want to do something we weren't built for. We are we are the seventy two Ford Pinto that is mad because it can't be in NASCAR. <laughs> you, you weren't built for NASCAR. It's not that you were made wrong. You just weren't built for what you think you want to do. Some of you would argue that because I I want to sing and I God won't let me sing. I was not built to sing out front in front of everybody let's say that because you know i i'd be blowing a shower boy i'd be whoop. i'd be hey this is the angels be looking go look at that boy go mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, Charlotte, cool. but but the the the, the, the bottom line is because that's what we get to when he talks about in uh verse 22 and what if god wanted to display his wrath and to make his power known endure with much patience objects of wrath prepared for destruction. I don't know what he wants to do with me. I don't know what he wants to do with you. And so when we start to accuse God of making us wrong, we are denying the plan that God has. And, and so, yep, God, I do appreciate the fact that he says, sometimes he just wants to show his wrath. And that's why he lets us act the nut sometimes. Mm -hmm. He lets us act the nut because he's like, look, I, I need to show you guys that just as much as I'm a God of love, I am also a God of wrath. And we, we need to understand the full picture of God. Any of you ever met somebody and you got to know part of them, you know, like when they was in public and oh, you loved that person. And then you got them in private and it was like, oh, oh, yes. oh. But God's like, no, look, I want to show you all of me. I, I want to go ahead and reveal it. And the way I reveal it, you might not understand what I'm doing. And so some of us would get upset because he says he wants to show his wrath, but and I'd like to, his wrath in his patience. Somebody tell me, because uh, a lot of people read the Old Testament and they tell me how mean, you know, the God of the Old Testament was mean and nasty and he did all this stuff and he hurt people. Anybody want to tell me how many years it was between God saying, hey, if you sin, I'm going to destroy Israel. And when he finally got them into captivity. No, I don't know how many. About 70 years when they went into captivity. No, was set, it, he gave them 70 years that they were going to get out. But how many right. years okay. from, from when they started after the nut until Assyria took over Israel? Was it 400 years? 400 years. 400 years. And so people say, oh, God was mean. He gave them 400 years to get right. He sent prophet after prophet after prophet saying, hey, y'all might need to turn around. And then when he finally judges, we like, oh, he mean. Look how mean he is. 400 years. Mm -hmm. And over and over again, even with Pharaoh, when he was mean to Pharaoh, he gave Pharaoh 10 opportunities. Yes. He gave the, the people of Egypt 10 chances to go, you know what? This God might, might be well, he, he might be something we need to respect. And so that show his wrath with great patience. So because what God is showing, he is showing all of himself. See, sometimes when we're dating, we only show part of ourselves. I, I don't yeah. want you to all of me. You know, I, 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 some of you probably seen the videos where you got these women, you know, they get married and they show them getting up an hour before their husband and, and putting makeup on because he ain't ever seen them without makeup. Because they ain't ready to show the real them. <laughs> 
God ain't worried <laughs> about you seeing. Matter of fact, God wants you to see the real him. Okay. The real him is what sets him apart. All right. right. All right. And not only does he talk about showing his wrath, but in verse 23, hey, what if he did this to make known the riches of his glory mm -hmm. on objects of his mercy that he prepared beforehand for glory? And so anybody remember John chapter nine? I don't, I, I don't know if I, I quoted this one last week or not. It's one of the 800 Bible studies we do. John chapter nine, there is a, uh, there's a man who was born blind. And the disciples asked, hey, why was this man born? Did his parents sin or did he sin? Anybody know the answer? What was Jesus' answer to that question? No Neither. one. Neither. Neither sin. So why, why was he blind? For, to show to, his glory. To show his glory. To show yeah. his glory. To show his glory. And, and so please understand, some of the stuff we get into, mm -hmm. God's just using it as, as an excuse to show off. Uh-huh. Well, I can't do that. And God's like, that, I know you can't. That's why I'm getting ready to show up and do it. Lazarus was dead. How many days was Lazarus dead? Four. Four days. Mara's all over it tonight. Mm -hmm. He was dead four days. The Jewish tradition was if you're dead three, the spirit goes away. And Jesus said, I'm glad I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, and why was he glad he wasn't there? So that you could see his power. They were looking for a healing. Jesus said, no, nah, I'm going to show you a resurrection. Because yeah. I want to show you that my power has no limits. And so that's why Paul later says, hey, when I am weak, then I am strong. I am strong. His power is made perfect, not in my strength, not in my holiness, but his power is made perfect in my weakness. weakness. So when we complain about our weaknesses, when we complain about all this wrong and say, God, you made me wrong. God's like, yo, just hold on because I'm about to show you something. And so when we see what, because understanding what God is doing, we don't have the same vantage point. I can't see everything that he's doing, but I got to believe, you know, we love Jeremiah 29, 11 when everything's going right. Anybody tell somebody tell me what Jeremiah 29 11 says? I know the plans I, I, plans I have. I know the you. plans I have. Plans to do what? Prosper. Prosper you. Not to and, harm you. And not to harm you. And to give you a future and hope. A hope and a future. And that sounds great when everything's right in our lives. But when it's not right, when the money ain't right. When people pass away, when we I don't sit, know. I've, I've used that scripture when I was having a hard time. And that's when you're supposed to use it. Can yeah. somebody tell me, does anybody know when God told them that? Was it when they were on the mountaintop? I don't know. So Jeremiah 29 is right in the middle of their Babylonian captivity. Wow. They, they, they were enslaved. These were God's people enslaved. And a word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and he told him, hey, you're slaves, but I want you to go ahead and get married. I want you to go ahead and pray for the city. And he tells him, live your life even in this negative circumstances. Why? Because I have a plan. And so in the middle of our struggles, in the middle of our playing, God's saying, I have a plan because you just don't know. Your pain is my opportunity to show my power. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm running around going, God, I don't know why you did this to me. You can run. This you got like, peace. Be still. Because oh, yeah. I am sovereign. I still have control. And so what Paul is directing us to in the midst of all of the struggle that we go through, we've got to do one thing. The same thing our money says, in God, we trust. We trust. And I've asked the question before, is your money, where is your life, is your mouth and your mind where your money is? Because your money says, we trust God. Your mind and your mouth, where are they? Somebody said, put your money where your mouth is. I need some of us to put our mouth where our money is. Because our money says we trust God. 
And Paul is saying, hey, you don't know what he's doing because he's got a plan. His glory is out there for us. And beautiful enough, verse 24, on a, the ones he called not only from the Jews, but also the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? Non-Jewish. Non-Jewish. That's us. Mm -hmm. That's us. So again, look what Paul's doing. He said, hey, God's not done with the Jews. And the Gentiles, you've got part of this too. One, one of the things people talk about a lot is they tell me how exclusive Christianity is. It, but God is very inclusive. The problem is he wants you to be included on his terms. We want inclusiveness on our own terms. I want to do what I want to do, live how I want to live, play how I want to play, and you go take me anyway. God like, no, 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 that, that, mm -mm, mm -mm, that's not how that thing works. But I have a plan, Jew or Gentile, I, to take the two and bring them together so there's no more two, but there's only one. Mm -hmm. and then he goes into quoting some scripture. Uh, and I love it when the, the Bible quotes the rest of the Bible, because for all those people who say the, New, the Old Testament doesn't matter anymore, you got a problem because uh, a lot of New Testament authors quote the Old Testament. So the Old right. Testament still matter. OK, and so first he quotes Hosea. Anybody know the story of Hosea? Oh, Hosea, can you see? <laughs> well, Hosea, is, Hosea is one of the freakiest stories to me in the Bible. So Hosea was a prophet. And God called the prophet and he said, hey, there's a prostitute um, down, in, down in the French Quarter. And, and I want you to marry her. Oh, I felt that maybe. Yeah, that yeah, he, he told the prophet to marry a prostitute. And, 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 and he would go, he, so he went, he, hey, God said marry, he married her. And, and, you know, he took the prostitute out the quarter, but he didn't take the quarter out the prostitute. And so every once in a while, she went back to what she used to do. And every time she left, guess what God told the prophet to do? Go get her. Go get her. Go get her. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, God told her, keep going there. Because God was setting a picture up. Yeah. He was using Hosea as a picture because my people keep prostituting themselves. Yeah. And I keep going to get them. Uh -huh. And then he had some children. And a couple of his children, he, uh, Hosea had children with the woman. Or we think they was with the woman. We don't. We think they was with the woman. Her name was Gomer. It was Gomer's baby. And it was Hosea's baby. I, yeah. I don't know. But, but one of the names of them, one of the names of the children, when you translate it, is not my people. Hmm. And, and, and oh, that's bad. Oh, he called the baby not my people. But look at what the promise is. I will call not my people. The children of the living God. My people. My, 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 my people. He, he said, yep, they, they were named on the outside. But I will bring them in. Okay? Not, not only that, hey, we've got, he had a daughter called unloved. She had loved. <laughs> People call her unloved, but what did God call her? <laughs> Beloved. Some folks done called you something. They, they done called you something. But God's got another name for you. As a matter of fact, if you read Revelation, he talks about he's going to give everybody a white stone with a name on it. And the only one who knows the name is the one he gives it to. God got a pet name for you, y'all. Mm. My mama got a pet name for you. I don't tell y'all what that is. Y'all you know, don't need to know. That makes you smile. God's got a pet name for you. The world's got some names for you too. But God's got a pet name. Go ahead, Wade. You done unmuted yourself. Here we go. Oh. <laughs> I didn't say just to hit it, but uh, but uh, also that goes with the uh, the adoption when we say uh, we are adopted mm -hmm. uh, because once again we are not the in the lineage uh, of being Jewish, but once again being Gentile. So I, 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 and I, and I keep coming back to it. And this has been several weeks. I keep coming back to it, but my daddy is my daddy. He might not have, I might not have been in the line, the blood, but then, but when he, but when he uh, adopted me, now I get all rights to what my daddy has. So whatever my daddy has, I now inherit. So it, 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 I got a wool trigger. I got a wool trigger. But but it it it, 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 it and you're so correct, Pastor, to where the inclusive God is so inclusive, you know, to where He would have none to perish, you know. But those that want to give themselves to Christ, they can, 
And, and I've always said this, you know, uh, when, when you're born, the uh, uh, guy voted for your soul, the devil voted for your soul. It's a tie vote. Who, who breaks the tie? You do. Now, you do nothing, you lose. You can uh, go with God, you win. You can get with this, you can get with that. So being God, where is that? You know, but I, uh, I didn't want to have to, I didn't want to have to go back and uh, do that to you. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and so, and I, I like your use of adoption because when we adopted Ayana, um, her name was Ayana Siobhan. And we changed her name because she belonged to us now. Now, I ain't going to lie, trying to stay in the will, so we call her Ayana Elizabeth. <laughs> So uh, it was just a coincidence. Just a coincidence. But but we changed her name. We, we gave her a new name. Not what they called her, but we called her something different because she was part of our family. And so God has that same attitude towards those who He's bringing in. And so I love this in verse twenty six. Or yeah, twenty six. And in the place where they were told, "You were not my people. You don't belong. You don't fit in." In that place. There they call. Go ahead, Virginia. Children of the living God. Dripping of the living. Where, where, and, and who's going to tell them that you're the children of the living God part? God. God is. God. God is. And so if God says it, does it really <laughs> matter <laughs> what anybody else says? No, no. No, no. Yeah, 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 yeah it, 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 it doesn't matter. Because we also say, hey, hey finish this for me. Sticks and stones. Break, break, break. Break, break. Break. Definitely break my okay. Now we know that. We, now, now some of us we know that's a lie. <laughs> that's right. There's some names that somebody called you in the third grade, and it hurt. And, and, and you, you know how I know it hurt? Because you're still dealing with it. Yeah. You, you're still dealing with it. You, you, they called you up. They text you right now. Hey, Fanny, Fanny, how you doing? <laughs> and, and, and it made you feel some kind of way. And, and, and the problem is, you answer to the name. There you go. That's our problem. Yeah. It ain't that they called us a name. It's hey, dumb butt. What? <laughs> what? That is not your name. Stop <laughs> answering to names that are not your name. Yes. All right. You know, but somewhere it says, uh, "Wait, we, I said, did we say it on Sunday? Oh no, that was a song just before we started service." He said, "There's a blessing out there, and it's got my name, name on it." And I'm pretty sure that the name, name they called me. It's got the name that God has called me, okay? And so we look at Hosea, and that's why Hosea's a good, because like I said, when you read the story of Hosea, it's not a pretty story, because his wife is out catting around all the time. <laughs> but that's a, it's a picture of the way God feels about his people, because if you read over and over again in the Old Testament, he says, my people are prostituting themselves. They cheat mm -hmm. me. And I know we don't look at it when we do stuff that we want to do it. We don't look like we're cheating on God. But God's like, no, no, because see, I said, no, you will have no other gods before me. That means you will follow my commands. But when you follow the commands of your flesh, guess what? You have another God. And if you have another God, that and I, that, that means you're cheating. Um, I would never cheat on my, on my man. I would never cheat on my woman. But somehow we cheat on our God. But the beauty of it is, he can come get us. See, some of us, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I love, I know my wife loved me, but she catch me cheating. Well, actually, she might come for me. She's going to come for you. That's going to piss the way that you don't want. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. She might come for me. It, it won't be the, it won't, it won't be the love. It won't be to bring me back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But God wants to bring us back. God's intent, God's, God's desire is to bring those who are not his people, those who aren't acting right, to bring them back into the fold. And so I need you because some of us are feeling outside right now. We are feeling unloved. We are feeling not his people. But God says, oh, no, 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 no. You are my people. You are beloved. All right. And so is it, uh, uh, what, what does he say about Jesus at the baptism? He said, this is my beloved son oh, in whom I'm well pleased. And I believe he's, he wants to speak that same thing over each one of us as well. Okay. All right. And so he goes from uh, Hosea 
to Isaiah. And we know Isaiah. Isaiah had a lot of, of things to say. And so he, when he talks about not my people, when he talks about unloved, he is really, you know, in a very real sense, speaking of the Gentiles. Because, you know, a good Jew would never hang out with a Gentile. <laughs> oh, you know, Peter, Peter, you know, Peter had actually crawled, well, Peter had said, hey, I, I can't eat with them because, you know, they un they unclean. And God said, don't call unclean what I call clean. So Peter was like, cool. Clean. And so Peter was at dinner having a, a some pork chops and, and, and uh, you know, a BLT, and he was loving it. And then some of the Jews came in the room and they was like, Peter. And the Bible said, Peter said, oh, no, no, I didn't do it. And Paul was like, no, no, you can't act like that because they're part of this thing now. All right. And so the Old Testament and most and, and through the ministry of Jesus, Gentiles were the unloved. Gentiles were all of that. And God's like, oh no, baby, I love you. They might not, but I do. And then Isaiah starts talking about Israel. And he says, Hey, you know what? The, the number of Israelite is like the sand of the sea. A anybody been to the beach and you see all that sand? Yeah. yeah. And actually, not just hey, hey, Miss Washington. You, you you remember when you used to take the boys to the beach, and you, you say, "Well, why'd you bring some of it home? So much of it home? Leave the beach, <laughs> at, the beach. <laughs> at the beach. I didn't want that sand in my living room. All right, but there's so much of it. And, and Isaiah says, "Ooh, there's a ton of sand, but you need to know that I mean, ton of Israelites. But you need to know when judgment comes, they are not excluded because they are the children of Israel." And I need to make sure we understand because uh, Peter will tell us when we get to Peter. He says, hey, please know that judgment from God starts where? Anybody know where it starts? Not oh. in the White House. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Renee. Oh. Home. Oh. 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 Yeah. Say again, Jackie. With the Jews. Nope. Nope. Not with the Jews. Okay. Nope. The judgment of God. About Peter says the judgment of God starts in the church of God. Yeah, I know. Somebody said, oh. That would be us. <laughs> that would be us. <laughs> if my people who are called by my name, judgment starts with the church of God. Uh -huh. He's going to get to us before we get to everybody else. And so we need to recognize and that's why this thing of Israel is so important because we think some of us, because we the church, oh God, God loves me. And since God loves me, he wouldn't let anything bad happen to me. But what does the Bible say God does with those he loves? Those he loves, he chastises. He chastises. <laughs> he chastises. Yeah. And so that's where judgment starts. So for us who think, hey, we got it all, we're, we're no problem. He's not going to judge us. We need to look at Israel. The Israel was the chosen people. But did God judge them? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Show sure enough. Uh -huh. And as a matter of fact, how bad was it? It says, hey, since the Lord will execute his sins com completely and decisively, when he's ready to judge, he gonna judge. And if he did it to Israel, hit the natural born son, those ado uh, us adopted kids, yeah, be real. And then, hey, as I, if the Lord of hosts had not left us a remnant, we would have been. Somebody tell me, what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? They got um, kids. Destroyed. destroyed. How much? Is a little bit? They got a little bit destroyed? Oh. No. The whole oh, thing. Love it. Utterly. Utterly. Utterly destroyed. And, and so Isaiah says, hey, if it had not been for God's mercy, all of Israel would have been just like that too. And how many times did we see it, uh, if you read through um, Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, where God says, yo, Moses, I'm going to kill all of them. I'm tired of this foolishness. And Moses said, uh, whoa, whoa, God, let, let's not do that. Let, let's not do that. Let, let, he stood in the gap for them. And, and so what this picture for us is there is a remnant. There is a remnant. And, and guess who gets to decide what happens with the remnant? It will God. be saved. It will be saved. But it's God. It's up to God. It's just back to his sovereignty. 
Because does God have a right to destroy all of us? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right now. Because all have fallen short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that we're in the remnant, we can't say it's, I'm in the remnant because I'm so special. I'm in the remnant because I pray. Because guess what? There's a whole lot of people in the church mm -hmm. who ain't really in the church. Matter of fact, we read earlier in chapter nine, Paul says all of Israel isn't really Israel. Mm -hmm. they, they might be carrying the name, but they don't have the relationship. That's right. Then there are other people. Yeah, I had to throw that out for you way before you got to it. There are, you know what? Hey, mom, you know, when I was in elementary school, I thought we were the only pains in the world. Mm -hmm. Our family, I thought we would, I, I didn't know, I, I thought the only pains were in my immediate family. And then I moved somewhere. Matter of fact, I got an email the other day from Lieutenant Colonel Payne up at uh, up at Minot. And I was like, where did all these other pains come from? Guess what? They got the name, but they're not related. We got some people who are carrying the name Christian, but they're not in the family. And, but, and who knows exactly who that is? That's God. Jesus told a parable. He said, hey, there are wheat and there are tares. And, and you know what it is about wheat and tares? Wheat and tares look exactly alike. Mm -hmm. You can't tell. You can't tell. You can't tell them apart. And if you try to pull the tears out, actually, until they bloom, until the fruit shows. That's right. That's right. And when the fruit shows, you say, oh, there's a tear. And if you try to pull the tears out, guess what happens to the wheat? It pulls the weed out. It pulls the weed out. Because, because the, the tears, when they grow, they wrap themselves around the roots of the wheat. And mm -hmm. God said, don't worry about it. I'll separate it. We so busy running around here trying to separate. Oh, you a tear. Oh, you wheat. You a tear. God's like, yo. Let me do that. You just produce fruit. I'll weed the garden. Mm -hmm. It's not your job to weed the garden. He says, let's see, let's see. I, Jesus said, I am the vine, and my father is the gardener. Let the gardener do what the gardener is supposed to do. And he knows who that remnant is. Our job is to, what we said about the money, be faithful and trust him. In the good times and the bad times, our challenge is to trust him through it all, all right? And, and, and so in the midst of all of this, God is picturing his sovereignty, his ability to do what he wants to do. And our challenge is to submit to his sovereignty, believing that he wants good for us. I mean, I mean, really, seriously, let me, I mean, and maybe I don't know if you want, I want to ask this question or not, or because we're on video and it's being recorded and I can see your faces, but do we really believe God has our best interests at heart? Yes. We work on feelings. And the reason why I say that is, is because God only gives us three answers and we only like one. No. What do you mean, God? Uh, no. What do you mean? No. I, it should be yes. Uh, wait. Oh, no, God, you don't know I need it right now. And then we get, yes. Ooh, God, pour it on me. That's what I want. Yes. So when we feel like we're getting what we want, if we feel uh, when we're getting it, when it's supposed to happen, we're good with God. Maybe that's how fickle we are. But when we're not getting what we want, when we think that the, uh, 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 when we get to know, but it should be yes, now we got an attitude. And 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 the 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 uh, the religious term for that that Brother Wade just described is some timing. Mm. It's some what? Timing. Some timing. Sometimes I like God. Sometimes I don't. What's that? Wait, 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 what's that? Almond joy has nuts. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes, sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you don't. Jesus. Sometimes we feel like we like Jesus. Sometimes we don't. And, and, and we've got to deal with that because when things look bad, we question who God is and whether his intent for us. But again, we, 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 we walk by faith. faith and not by sight. So when we spend all our time saying, it just looks so bad. It looks so bad. Okay. You're supposed to not walk by what you see, but you're going to walk by faith. What he said. 
what he said. And he said, and back to 2911, Mara, thank you very much. I know the plans I have. So just because something looks bad, does that mean God's plan has been completely messed up? Never. No. Because God wouldn't let this happen to me. If God loved me, I wouldn't have this. If God loved Jesus, certainly did. No, no, he couldn't have loved Jesus because they spit on him. They couldn't have loved, he couldn't have loved Jesus because they whipped him. He couldn't God have loved him because they hung him on a cross. No, because all of that had a purpose behind it. <laughs> well, the way they treat me, because God's got a purpose. Because mm -hmm. somewhere he says, I will make your enemies your footstool. But if you don't have any enemies, so you have to have enemies to get a footstool. And we so busy running and crying, I got to be like me. No, I need some people to not like me. Because I got to have somebody to eat in front of. Because yeah. I will, he will prepare a table for me in the, in the presence of my enemy. In the presence of my enemies. So I need some people. So that, that's what, again, I told y'all before, I, I think I mentioned it at the Thursday Bible study. When I, at my retirement ceremony, I made sure to thank the three people that stood uh, the biggest in my way in, in my Air Force career. I thank them because if it wasn't for them, I would not have known I really wanted to be in the Air Force. If it wasn't for them, I would not have tried harder to make sure that I proved them wrong. And by God's grace, I made it way farther than they ever thought. And so they became a footstool, not so I could step on them, but so I could step up higher with them. That was not their intent. But for me to whine and cry because some people didn't like me, for whatever reason they didn't like me, and like, I don't remember Jesus whining and crying. God, they don't like me. I'm doing all these miracles and they don't like me. But Jesus said, if they hated me, they're sure going to hate you. They showing up going to hate you. Mm. And that should not be a reason for us to stop. Matter of fact, some people, I've heard some preachers say, hey, if you don't have anybody that hates you for your faith, you're doing it wrong. Maybe, maybe your faith is wrong. Maybe you ain't got no faith because you're you, you going in the same way. You know, salmon swim upstream. And Christians should be swimming upstream too. We should be going against the current. Because even in that, God's got a blessing. As a matter of fact, Sam is swimming upstream. Why? Because they're getting ready to produce. And if we're going to produce, we might need to turn away from the flow and start heading upstream. But to do that, we got to trust God. Okay? All right. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Wade, why don't you go ahead and read for us the rest of the chapter 30, 30 through 33. Okay. Hey, Pastor, can I, can I comment on uh, 28 real quick? Please do. Um, and, and I like this, um, for the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. Uh, I got two things. I haven't heard that in a while. But, uh, uh <laughs> Well, one, God is not constrained by time. So, you know, so when we look at it, when we, uh, we're we judging God on our time, you know, because God, you won't come soon enough, you know. God, if you would have came quicker, you know, this, uh, I, this, all this wouldn't have happened to me. But God isn't constrained by speed you know, or isn't constrained by time. And his time is one word perfect, just like his plan is perfect, that the plan that he has for us. Our plans are what? Wrong, raggedy, flawed, and full of holes. You know, those are our plans. You know, uh, but just as God is perfect, so is his plan and everything that he does by his hand. And the second part of that is, I like that, and finality. When we look at going in the court system, we want to go to the highest court in the land. Uh, we want to keep going if we are not, uh, uh, if we don't get uh, reciprocity. We don't get reciprocity. We're going to keep bumping it up and bumping it up and bumping it up to the uh, to the highest court in the land, which is the Supreme Court. But but here we're going to go to the highest entity, which is God. And when God says it's done and it's over, that's what it is. It's done and it's over. You know, you can't, oh, well, you know what? Let me go appeal to somebody else. You know, let me go to Madam Cleo. Call me now. No, you can't do that. You know, you know when God, God says it's it, it's it. You can have your lips poked out all you want, but that'd be between you and God. And we, we know who's going to win that battle. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Wayne. Now, now give me 31 through 33. 31 through 33. 30, 30, 30 through 33. 
33, gotcha. Sure. What shall we say that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, a righteousness that is by faith, but Israel who pursued a law of righteousness has not attained it? That's, that's that thing right there. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. All right. And so one of the things also, you know, and I think we've talked about this before in several studies. God is very simple in the fact that we only have two choices. Life, death, well, he breaks things down into you saved or you unsaved. It, it, there's no there's no middle ground. I got Jews, I got Gentiles. And those are Jews, those are not Jews. He, he, he doesn't deal with all these other things. If he is not, our dealing with God is not an Applebee's menu. Because, you know, they change their menu every couple of minutes and it got 400 items on it. And then the next day you have 400 different items on it. And God's like, no, nah, I'm not going to put all that on you. You got two choices. And so he comes down to Jews and Gentiles. And the, what he's talking about here is the approach that the Jews and the Gentiles have to being righteous. What does it mean to be righteous? Right standing with God. Right standing with God. Thank you. Yeah, right standing with God. I, I have that. And, and so the, Jew, the Gentiles got to be righteous because they kept the law and they did everything right. No. 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 Well, then how they did they, that's how you get right with God. You do have to do the law. How, how did they get righteous? Jesus came to fulfill the law. Okay, he fulfilled the law, but what, 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 what do I have to do to make me righteous? Faith. Faith, it says in verse uh, 30, they, they obtain righteousness, namely righteousness that comes from faith. We are justified by faith. faith. It is faith that makes that difference. And so, and really, this is kind of the blessing that the Gentiles had because the Gentiles didn't have the law to start with. Paul talked about it earlier in the chapter, the law came through the Jews. And that what became their stumbling block because they believed, which God never said, you will be righteous by keeping the law because how many of them could keep the law? None. How many of us can keep the law? No. So there's some people around who are saying, hey, I'm going to heaven because I keep the law. And our response to them should be, no. Better read the Bible. <laughs> Everybody here said, you a liar. That's not nice. My mom and God, I got a trouble saying that. You're telling, you telling a story. You're telling a story. You're telling a story. No, no. And that's we're going to talk about this in a minute. We're going to talk about because Paul deals with that in uh, chapter 10. And we might actually get there tonight. Oh, praise God. All right. And so, because we saw this, right? This was what, this was their problem when Jesus showed up. Because it was like, well, you didn't wash your hands long enough. And you, you did stuff on the Sabbath. And it was all about, it was all about legalism. And we need to be very careful. While we have, there, there are standards that we are supposed to keep. Those standards do not make us righteous. Okay, be very careful about assigning all of these things. And as long as you check off all of these blocks, you're righteous. No, I'm righteous by my faith. And because of that, I live in such a way to please God. But my, my doing all of these things doesn't make me saved or any more saved. You're not more saved than me because you do 12 things, I only do five. There's no checklist in this thing that says, hey, as long as you do all of this, and that's where the Jews got tangled up because they were measuring it. Oh, look at them. Oh, they're so holy. That's why they used to go to the, when they tithe, they would, they, would get, they would go to the bank on the way to church. And they would take all their cash and they would make it coins. And, and when you put the money in, it had a metal, it was a metal kind of a metal funnel. And so when they came up and put their money in, you hear, <laughs> Woo, look at how much money they're giving. It's all pennies. It's still a dollar. It's, it's just a loud dollar. That's all because they, they wanted to appear righteous. Mm. They wanted people to say, they, they wanted to pray out in the streets. They'd stop in a street corner. 
Holy God, oh Father Almighty, the great and one. Woo, look at him. Woo, didn't he pray? And God, God was saying, and Jesus said, you know, they would pray to themselves, which implies they weren't talking to God. So you'll get your reward. What was the reward they wanted? They wanted someone to tell them how wonderful they were. And God's like, and like, God, where's my reward? Oh no, you got that? When everybody told you how good you were? That was it. That was it. Go ahead, Renee. I was legalism when I wanted an excuse to do something that I knew was wrong. Wait, say that again. I noticed that in my life that I got very legalistic <laughs> when I was trying to find an excuse to do something that I knew was wrong. <laughs> well, I had to cover it up, right? Because because the scales, remember the scales? Yeah, okay, let me see. Let me see. I'm gonna go to church and I'm gonna give an extra dollar and I'm gonna sing real loud because I know this week I'm going to North Carolina. <laughs> oh <laughs> I, I don't know why North Carolina came out right there, but but exactly. I'm gonna do this stuff because I want to make sure, and then I, then I'm gonna drive around and look at other people who didn't do what I did, yeah. and so that I can feel superior to them. That's mm -hmm. not righteousness, y'all. That 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 is pride. That 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 is that is sin. All right, and so at the end of this chapter, um. Paul gives us, hey, this is the key. The issue that you've got going on here is he said, I'm going to put a stumbling stone in Zion, a, something to stumble over, a rock to trip over. And the one who believes on him will not put the chain. Who is the stumbling block? Jesus. Jesus. And what he's saying here is in our life, every human being has to deal with this stumbling block. Either Jesus is going to be something to trip you up or to hold you up. He trips us up when we try to get around him and we don't want to deal with him because we're looking somewhere else and we fall over. Anyway, one day I'm going to preach this. Um, but every one of us has watched a horror movie or some Lifetime movie. And, and when the girl runs away on Lifetime, on Lifetime or her, what happens? She falls. She falls. Wrong on lifetime. Because <laughs> she's yeah. not watching, she's not watching where she's going. There are people in life right now who are not watching where they're going, and in the end, they're gonna trip over Jesus. Mm. The Jews tripped over Jesus, they refused to accept him for who he was. And what Paul's saying here is the Gentiles, because they weren't caught up in the law for the most part, didn't trip over him. We stood on him. Because we are saved by trusting him. See, I only stand on stuff that I can trust. You know, when I want to reach something real high, I get something to stand on. I don't stand on a cardboard box. Because I weigh a little much. And I stand on a cardboard box, it's coming down. But I get something I can stand on. And guess what? See, my hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood. And righteousness. Yeah. That that I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I wholly lean on Jesus' name. And so, just like the question Jesus asked the disciples, "Who do men say that I am?" Every human being has to answer that question, and either we answer it now, or we answer it then. And that is going to make the decision. God is not going to ask us, so tell me how much you tithe. So tell me how much scripture, just recite some scripture for me. And if you have, there's this guy on Facebook that my wife watches, that he goes around the grocery stores, mm -hmm. and he asks people biblical questions. And, and he's like, so, you know, how many disciples were there? And they looking around. That, that, that works in the grocery store, that's not going to work at the gates of heaven. Because the only question that we're going to be asked is, who do you say Jesus is? He was a good dude. Jesus was a good dude. And everybody says, and Jesus was, he was just a lover. He just loved people. And Jesus was a prophet. 
<laughs> Jesus was the Christ, the <laughs> Son of the Living God. That that that's the answer. And, and when everybody else, you know, people they oh I mean, we believe in Jesus, but he was we, we believe in some sub Jesus. If he wasn't God or nothing, well then you got a problem because you believe in Jesus Jenkins. <laughs> We believe in Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God, okay? And so we have to deal with it. Hey, I, I want to get to this one real quick because this ties in. Because remember, remember the chapters didn't exist, right? So we got a break between 9 and 10 that I don't think that Paul did not have. Because when Paul talked about Jesus being the, the rock that they, they tripped over him to being the stumbling block, but that everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. When we place our faith in him, I don't have to worry when I get to heaven that God is going to ask me a trick question. Well, what else did you have? What else did you bring? You got nothing else. Oh, man, you needed more. No, no. I trust in Jesus. I believe in him. And I will not be put to shame. Um, let's see. Dion, can you read for me? Where'd she go? Okay, she's still there. All right. Karen, can you read for me? Give me um, Ro uh, Romans 10. Give me one through, actually just one through four. I can read. Oh, there's Dion. Dion, yeah, give me, give me, give me uh, Romans 10, one through four. I'm sorry about that. Mute struggle. <laughs> okay. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a certain enthusiasm mm -hmm. for God, but not in accordance with correct and vital knowledge about him and his purposes. For not knowing what God's righteousness, which is based on faith, and seeking to establish their own righteousness based on works, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law. It leads to him and its purpose is fulfilled in him. For granting righteousness to everyone who believes in him as Savior. All right. For Moses, I'm sorry. Yeah, you can stop, yeah, stop right there. Stop right there. Okay, here, here, here's the tie-in that I want to get. Hey, Paul, again, he says the one thing he wants for them, and them in this case is Israel. What's the one thing he wants? He wants them to, to all be rich. <laughs> he wants them to all, you know, just have peaceful lives with no trouble. What's he want? He wants salvation. He wants salvation for them. The one thing, my, my, my heart's desire, my prayer to God concerning them is salvation. Here's why I'm bringing this up. What is your heart's desire for the people in your life? That they be saved. Is that, is that our heart's desire? Yeah. I want to be sure. Because some of us, we want our children to be happy. No. Our heart's no, desire is for them to be happy. Our heart's desire is for them to be rich, healthy, wealthy, and wise. But do we put salvation at the top of that list? And the question, if it's our heart's desire for them to be saved, what are we doing about it? Because mm -hmm. Paul says, my heart's desire and prayer to God. Is their salvation. Because he says in verse two, I can testify they have a zeal for God. They want to know God, but not according to God. Does that sound like 2023? Mm -hmm. We got all these spiritual people out here. They believe there's something out there that's mm -hmm. higher. They have a desire to know it. So they done bought some crystals. They done bought some books. They done bought all this stuff. They have a zeal for this, but it's not according to knowledge. knowledge. Not, not according. They, they're excited. The world wants God. They just want to package him in their own that's man. Right. We, we want a God that look like us. We, we, we want a God like, uh, everybody remember when Moses went up to the mountain, he said, Aaron, you in charge. I need you to take care of things while I'm away. And then all of a sudden they walked up to Aaron and they said, Aaron, make us a God. And Aaron said, no, nah, man, I ain't going to do that. That ain't right. We got a God. Okay. No, that's not what he did. Oh, that's not what he did? Oh, oh no. Said, okay. I'll do it. Okay. And he said, give me your earrings. Give me that gold. 
and, and, and give me all your gold. And they threw it in. And then when Moses came down, and said, where does chaos come from? You remember what Aaron said? <laughs> People. And, he, he said, he said, we put the gold in and this calf jumped out. That's the father of priests, y'all. <laughs> the calf jumped out. Why? Because they had a zeal for God, but they wanted to make him in the image that they could handle. Because guess what? A cow is a domesticated animal. I control a cow. I milk a cow. I walk a cow. So if I, my God is a cow, guess what? I can milk him for all he got, and I can walk him over and put him where I want to. I can put him out of pasture. That's the kind of God many of us want. And we, if we want them to be saved, we cannot just accept their desire for God. We need to share with them the God according to knowledge. And that knowledge comes from where? Relationship. The word of God. Because faith comes by hearing. And hearing by hearing. the word of God. By the word of God. The word of God. So if our desire is their salvation, if we want them to be saved, my question is, are we sharing the word of God? Or are we just telling them our opinion? Because I don't think faith comes by hearing and hearing by our opinion. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by our, uh, our thoughts and insights into life and theology. No, it comes by hearing the word of God. And, what, and that's what we taught. I, I, I can tie this into tomorrow's Bible study. Because I talk about what are you doing with the word? Because it's the word that's going to save people's lives. It's the word that's going to change the world. But if we are not, if we are just sitting on the word, then people are going to die because they don't have the tool they need to have faith. Because our righteousness comes from faith. And we'll talk about this more next week as we break this down. But I wanted to get that last part in there because Paul starts chapter nine talking about, hey, I would give up my salvation so they could be saved. And then he starts chapter 10 by saying, hey, look, I pray my heart's desire. The number one thing I want for them is their salvation. And so just like I said last week, this week, same homework. If the people you were supposed to pray about and pray for last week didn't get saved last week, guess what I want you to do this week? Keep praying. Keep praying. Keep praying. And when God, and, and not if, but when God gives you the opportunity, give him the word. Because guess what God wants? God wants, guess what God wants more than you want? He wants them to be saved. He's not willing, uh, Wade mentioned it, he's not willing to any should perish, but that all should come to salvation. So he wants it, and if we are agreeing with him that we want it too, he might just give us the opportunity to say something on his behalf. And the question is, what are we going to say? Oh, you nasty, you going to hell. <laughs> Somebody find that verse for me. Find that verse for me. You nasty, you going to hell. No, I don't think that's in there. That's not the word of God. We're supposed to be, that, that's not the word of God. That, that's striking the rock and not speaking to the rock. All right? Because we know some rock-headed people. But we just need to speak the word of God as opposed to hitting them over the head with it. Okay? All right. Questions or comments? Pastor, on, on, when I was, uh, when we were talking, I think with our relationship, I had to put that in there. I like get it in one time with our relationship it's going to provoke us to to action and that action should be prayer but we also use our relationship and we use our knowledge of our relationship with God uh, uh, for testimony as well so all those things work together because then we're testifying about our faith and and, and then you know and then with that then uh, this is a, another week. I got to go back to uh, uh, Galatians. Then we're using the fruits of the spirit as well. So it all ties into that, uh, uh, that, that, that nice tight knit ball uh, 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 of everything that God has for us, which is his plan, which is perfect. And if we, if we, if we go ahead and do that, it comes back to, again, I'm going to use it uh, for what I did a couple of weeks ago. We win. And not only do we win, we win souls for God. 
And then so the next person can say, hey, I win. And, we, and, and they can make it real personal. I win because I want to win. And in all inclusive, we win. So, you know, we, we got we, we got to uh, uh, be talking, you know, about our own you know relationship with God and with that testimony, because with some, uh, uh, this, you know, of course, everybody has a different testimony. But when people can understand or hear where you came from to see that you're genuine, you know, that touches people. And that's our end. That's our end to introduce them to God. Absolutely. And we will talk about that a lot more next week as we get into our responsibility uh, in this is when it comes to winning souls. The Bible says he who wins souls is wise. Some of us calling ourselves wise, but we ain't trying to win no souls. And that's a, that, that's a problem. So, OK. All right. Anybody else? Questions or comments? I do want to ask as we prepare, prepare to close in prayer. Mother Williams is in the hospital. Um, please keep her and her family in prayer as we try to uh, push her through uh, this trial that she is going through and um, want to uh, just ask that we keep, yeah, keep them and the family in prayer, okay? All right, let's pray. Eternal God, thank you for calling us beloved. Thank you for calling us your people. Now, God, give us the good sense to act like it. Give us the good sense to act like we are loved by you. Give us the good sense not to be so focused on what our enemies say, but focused on what you say. God, as we move through this life, give us a desire, a passion, not just for our own salvation, but for the salvation of those that you have put in our lives. Give us the courage to speak your word to them. Give us the desire to pray for them and to bring them before you repeatedly, God, because that is what we want. Your words has cast all your cares and we care for them. So God, whatever names, uh, what other people are in our lives, Lord God, give us that care, that same care that you have because you want to adopt them into the family, but you'll only adopt them if they come by faith. So God, we ask right now as a church family that we lift up Sister Juanita Williams and the entire Williams Battles family. We ask that you will care for them, comfort them. We ask that you will bring healing. Do a supernatural work because we know you have the power. And God, we, like our money, are trusting you in this situation and in every situation because you are the sovereign God. And we believe in you. We are standing now on the rock that is Christ so that we can live and move in you. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. 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 Thank you very much, everybody, for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody Thank have you. a blessed week. And you as well. We'll be back here tomorrow at noon uh, for the noon Bible study. So we'll, hey. we'll talk to you. Come on, I said hi. <laughs> She's waiting for you to say hi. Hi, everybody. Bye -bye. I see Mr. Hart. Hi, everybody. 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 Hi, everybody.